Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're, we're ready to get started. Welcome to the Army Heritage and Education Center. My name is Michael Lynch, and uh, on behalf of our director, Lieutenant Colonel Mark Viney, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this month's Perspectives in Military History Lecture Series. Before we begin, there are a couple of special guests that we would like to, rec like to recognize at the request of uh, Dr. Winton, our guest speaker. First of all, his wife, Ms. Barbara Winton. Please stand up. Thank you very much. We're happy to have you here. And a great thrill and pleasure for all of us. Uh, tonight, Dr. Winton will talk about Corps Commanders in the Battle of the Bulge but we have with us a veteran of the Battle of the Bulge. Lieutenant Colonel Sam Lombardo, please stand up. And sir, thank you for your service. Also, another uh, special a couple of guests that we, uh, that we have in the back, uh, Dan and Justine Munkin, thank you very much. Uh, personal friends of the Wintons. We're pleased to have these, uh, have these guests join us tonight. Well, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, as you've already seen, uh, we're going to, uh, to have a discussion of a critical period in American military history. Dr. Hal Winton is the author of Corps Commanders of the Battle of the Bulge, Six American Generals and Victory in the Ardennes. He also wrote To Change an Army, General Sir John Burnett Stewart and British Army Doctrine, 1927 to 1938. He co-edited The Challenge of Change, Military Institutions and New Realities, 1918 to 1941. Dr. Winton is a graduate of the Air Command and General Staff College, an honor graduate of the Command and General Staff College, and a graduate of the Advanced Operational Studies Fellowship Program. He holds a, a Bachelor of Science from the United States Military Academy and a Master's and a Ph.D. from Stanford University. Ladies and gentlemen, from the Air War College, Dr. Hal Winton. Can you hear me in the back? Hear me in the back okay? Wonderful. Mike, thanks a lot for that introduction. Uh, it's both a distinct honor and a source of great pleasure to be back at Carlisle, where much of the research for the book that I'm going to be talking about tonight was conducted. I'm always impressed by the supportiveness of the staff of this fine institution, uh, Colonel Viney, and uh, I find it particularly gratifying to be speaking in a magnificent facility named for one of the protagonists of my book, uh, General Matthew Bunker Ridgeway. Uh, it makes tonight all the more meaningful. And I would also like to thank all of you uh, who braved the cold uh, to come out tonight. Uh, and as cold as we are, let us not forget that Sam and his comrades were much colder in the period that I'm going to be talking about. And they didn't have a nice warm place to get in out of the cold. To begin this evening, I feel I owe you a word of explanation of why this book and why now. A few years ago, I heard Rick Atkinson talking about the impending final volume of his World War II trilogy. When an interviewer asked him what, why he was doing it, he replied, quote, Well, we think we know the story. Normandy? the bulge, crossing the Rhine, and the drive into Germany. But actually, we don't. There's more to it than we think there is. Unquote. Rick is absolutely right. And in this sense, all good history is revisionist history because it revises our understanding of the past and helps us to understand it both more accurately and more meaningfully. So my story of the bulge, seen through the eyes of six corps commanders, whose role in this epic campaign has never been properly appreciated, will hopefully give you a richer understanding of this great enterprise than you might have had previously. Why now? Well, I think here we should look both backward and forward. Looking back, the bulge battle was fought just over 65 years ago. This is less than rough, the roughly 70 years that elapsed between the end of the American Civil War and Douglas Southall Freeman's four-volume biography of Robert E. Lee and his three volumes of Lee's Lieutenant. The point is that history takes time to settle and, if done well, should improve with age. 
Looking forward, the U.S. Army is in the process of a significant transformation, one important aspect of which is changing from a division-based force to a brigade-based force. This change makes the division of the 21st century the analog of the core of the World War II era. The division is still in the process of finding its role in this new scheme of things. And I believe that as it does, commanders and staff officers can look back to the experience of the World War II Corps with some profit. Okay, uh, to set the stage here, my purpose in writing the book has been to assess the challenges faced by and the accomplishments of six men who commanded U.S. Army Corps during the largest battle ever fought by the United States Army, the Battle of the Bulge. Achieving this goal requires a brief explanation of what a Corps was in World War II and the battlefield function it performed. The Corps was an echelon of command between the field army and the division. It acted as a flexible command module to which the army commander could attach a variable number of maneuver divisions, artillery groups, and other combat support assets with which to fight an extended portion of a major operation in accordance with the shifting requirements of a dynamic battlefield. As such, other than its headquarters and a few core troops, it had no fixed organization. The core commander thus had to deal with a frequently changing array of principal subordinates to carry out his various missions. Further compounding matters congressionally imposed research uh, grade limitations made his authorized rank of major or two-star general exactly the same as of the division commanders who reported to him. Thus, corps commanders were not only forced to deal with pickup teams, they had to do so without the leverage of superior rank. Corps normally commanded from two to five divisions, a variable number of artillery groups commanded by the Corps Artillery Commander, and a similar varying allotment of support formations. And depending on its organization, they would vary in size from about 30,000 to 80,000 soldiers. But Corps commanders' lives were made somewhat simpler by their freedom from logistical responsibilities. It was precisely this freedom that enabled the Corps' tactical flexibility. The six American commanders, Corps commanders who fought in the Bulge, are names that are familiar here at Carlisle. They were Ma Major General Leonard T. Giroux, CG 5th Corps, Troy H. Middleton, C H CG 8th Corps, Matthew B. Ridgway, CG 18th Airborne Corps, John Milliken, CG 3 Corps, perhaps not so familiar, and Manton S. Eddy, C.G. 12th Corps, and J. Lawton Collins, uh, for whom Collins Hall is named, C.G. 7th Corps. My remarks this evening will address four questions. What were these men taught about command? How did they grow professionally from their pre-commissioning studies to the bulge? What effect did they and their corps have on the campaign itself? And how well did their actions and orders live up to what they had been taught? Careful parsing of the Army's field service regulations and instructional material at the Command and General Staff School and the Army War College allows one to put together the Army's philosophy of command into seven fairly straightforward roughly prioritized attributes. In other words, if you wanted to paint the ideal picture of a commander, here's what the inner war army said you should be. Assumption of sole responsibilities for all the commander's unit failed, did, or failed to do. The strength of will to see the mission through to completion despite numerous obstacles. The mental acuity to size up complex situations quickly and accurately, 
the appreciation for possibilities offered by widely different types of terrain, care for one's subordinates, rapidity of action, and, as alluded to earlier, an ability to suffer privation in the face of many physical demands of ground combat. Now, these attributes were never laid out quite as explicitly as I have just shared them with you, but they do represent the generally accepted standards to which commanders were held in the interwar and World War II armies. And now what I'd like to do is trace for you the pre-bulge career of our six protagonists. The idea here is to be able to answer this question. Knowing what we know about the officer up to the eve of the bulge, what would we guess about his conduct in the coming campaign? Because remember, on the 15th of December, 1944, practically nobody saw this thing coming. Leonard T. Giroux, pictured here in about December 1944, was born in Petersburg, Virginia on 13 July 1888. He graduated from the Virginia Military Institute in 1911 and accepted a commission in the infantry. He was temporarily transferred to the Signal Corps and during World War I had solely administrative duties. At CGSS in 1925 and 26, he and his younger classmate and close friend, Dwight Eisenhower, formed a productive two-man study team, with Eisenhower graduating first in his class and Giroux 11. In December 1940, he became head of War Plans Division under George Marshall. In February 1942, he assumed command of the 29th Infantry Division and led it to England. In July 1943, he was elevated to command of 5th Corps, which was assigned the toughest of the D-Day missions, assaulting Omaha Beach. On D-Day, when the attack on Bloody Omaha almost ended in disaster, Giroux kept his head and saw the venture through to success. But in his next big test, the bitter fighting in the Hurtgen Forest in the fall of 1944, his leadership was noticeably less inspired, particularly in the debacle at Schmidt. Thus, the question we must ask on the eve of the bulge is which Giroux is going to show up, the Giroux of Omaha Beach or the Giroux of Schmidt? Bet you didn't drive here like that tonight. Troy H. Middleton, pictured here in January 1945, was born in Copia County, Mississippi, on 12 October 1889. After graduating from Mississippi A&M College, he enlisted in the Army and in 1913 received a direct commission in the infantry. His World War I experience was exemplary. During the Mose argonne Offensive, he commanded a battalion and a regiment in successful attacks, earning accolades from his brigade commander as, quote, the best all-round officer I've been privileged to observe in the AEF, unquote. Entering CGSS in 1923, he graduated 18th in his class. Oh, by the way, for you Patton buffs, that was seven ahead of George Patton. I'll tell you a story about that later. Uh, following six years of, uh, oh, he and he taught on the faculty for four years after he graduated. Following six years of ROTC duty at Louisiana State University and a brief assignment in the Philippines, he retired in 1937. Brought back to active duty in 1942, he rose to command the 45th Infantry Division. After the division had fought very commendably in Sicily and Italy, Middleton requested relief from command because of a knee injury. Eisenhower, unworried by the knee, selected him to command 8th Corps, 
which led Patton's breakout at Avranche. After bitter fighting to secure the Breton ports, 8th Corps was transferred to the Ardennes, where it was ordered to defend along an 80-mile front. Everything about Middleton's career up to this point suggests that he would handle whatever came at him in the bulge competently and unflappably. Now, there's a tough-looking airborne soldier. Matthew B. Ridgway, pictured here in October 1943, was born on 3 March 1895 at Fort Monroe, Virginia. Graduating from West Point in 1917, he was commissioned in the infantry. Returning to the academy to teach foreign languages, he became proficient in Spanish, which super served him well when he helped supervise elections in Nicaragua. After graduating 46 from the CGSS class, he became the Second Army G3 and further solidified his already close relationship with Marshall, who later picked Ridgway to accompany him on a sensitive mission to Brazil and serve in the War Plans Division. In January 1942, he became Omar Bradley's assistant commander of the 82nd Infantry Division. When Bradley was transferred to command of another division, Ridgway inherited the 82nd and converted it to an airborne unit. The 82nd's baptism of fire in Sicily established Ridgway as a tough, aggressive commander. This reputation was confirmed by the 82nd's superb performance in the Normandy campaign, and Ridgway was subsequently elevated to command of the newly formed 18th Airborne Corps. Alliance politics kept Ridgway's Corps out of the airborne invasion of Holland. So the question we're left with here on the eve of the bulge is, will Ridgway be as good a corps commander as he was a division commander? John Milliken, pictured here between Leslie J. McNair and Charles S. Kilburn in April 1944, was born on 7 January 1888 in Danville, Indiana. He graduated from West Point in 1810 and was commissioned in the cavalry. Now, parenthetically, of the six American Corps commanders in the bulge, he is the only cavalryman. While stationed at Fort Myer, Virginia, he married Mildred March, daughter of Army Chief of Staff Peyton March. He served in World War I as Deputy Provo Marshal of the AEF. Following the war, he became the aide to General March. During the interwar years, he grew professionally, spending a total of 10 years teaching in the Army school system and two years as a student. When he returned to troop duty in 1936, he began a steady rise up the ladder of command. During the Third Army maneuvers of 1940, his 6th Cavalry Regiment earned kudos from numerous observers. A year later, he was given command of the 2nd Cavalry Division and later the 33rd Infantry Division. In September 1943, he was elevated to command of three corps. The corps headquarters arrived in Europe in the autumn of 1944 and became operational at Metz in early December. So here's the question for Milliken. How will a man who has never seen a day of real combat in his whole life handle the incredible stresses of the bulge. Matt Ness Eddy, pictured here in May 1943, was born in Chicago on 16 May 1892. He graduated from a military preparatory school in 1913 and received a direct commission as a first lieutenant of infantry in 1916. During World War I, he served as commander of a machine gun company. While a student at the infantry officer's advance course, he came to Marshall's attention for a riveting account of his combat experience. He graduated 49th in his class from CGSS in 1934 and served on the Leavenworth faculty for four years thereafter. 
He performed admirably, admirably as a regimental commander in the Carolina maneuvers of 1941, and in mid-1942 was appointed command of the 9th Infantry Division. The division had a rough baptism of fire in North Africa, but regained its footing in the seizure of Bizerte. The 9th ID's rapid capture of Cherbourg during the Normandy campaign led to Eddie's elevation to command of 12th Corps in August 1944. During the Lorraine campaign, Eddie's command medal, medal was tested both by the Germans and by having to recommend that Patton relieve General John P. Wood as commander of the 4th Armored Division. Nevertheless, by December 1944, one could anticipate that while Eddie would play his cards close to his vest in any future battles, he would play them well. J. Lawton Collins, pictured here in February 1945, was born in New Orleans on 1 May 1896. He graduated from West Point in 1917 and a year later was sent to Germany for occupation duty. While serving as an instructor at Fort Benning in the late 1920s, he became part of Marshall's inner circle. After graduating 22nd in his class at CGSS, he served in the Philippines, then attended the Army War College. He next served on Marshall's staff in the Army's Secretariat, garnering the Chief's endorsement that he was, quote, outstanding in the Army. What that meant in martial parlance was, this guy is the number one colonel in the United States Army. And that comment was handwritten by Marshall on Collins's efficiency report. Immediately after Pearl Harbor, he became chief of staff of the Hawaii Department and subsequently commander of the 25th ID. The Tropic Lightning Division performed well in the elimination of Japanese resistance at Guadalcanal. But Collins's brash and rather cocksure command persona earned less than glowing remarks from his superiors. In other words, he sort of blotted his copybook out there in the Pacific. But Eisenhower needed combat experience for command of 7th Corps in Europe. And through Marshall's good offices, Collins landed both the interview and the job. He fully justified Ike's faith in him with his brilliant breakout from Normandy in Operation Cobra. By December 1944, his total grasp of command would have led somebody to believe that he could handle whatever came at him in the bulge with balance and finesse. Okay, I'm going to talk about the stage on which these people acted, the Ardennes Forest. The Ardennes is a geographic term given to a largely forested region of eastern Belgium, northern France, and the western half of Luxembourg. The region roughly resembles a large right triangle with its apex pointed to the southwest. The eastern base runs along 90 miles from the German town of Monschau down to Luxembourg. The southern base runs from Luxembourg to Mezières. And then the western and northern part of the bulge is defined by the Meuse River, which runs north to Dinant, then Namur, then Liège, and then the line goes back here to Mon Monschau. So this is the part of Europe that we're talking about. Major terrain features in the eastern part of the Ardennes include high ground right around here, the town of Elsenborn. This is known as the Elsenborn Ridge. Now, this is something of a misnomer. If you go to what's called the Elsenborn Ridge and think you're going to look up like that and see a long, flat piece of terrain, you're wrong. Instead, you stand there and it gently slopes up and then it undulates. And it's a perfect place to put lots of artillery, and that will come into play later. 
South of the Elsinborn Ridge is an area known as the Low Sime Gap. This is where Rommel came through in 1940. South of Low Sime Gap is a large promontory called the Schnee Eiffel. South of the Schnee Eiffel is high ground called the Skyline Drive along here. Here we have the Hour and the Clareff Rivers, which both flow from north to south and which were obstacles to the German attack. Here we have the Sewer River, which becomes the Zauer, where it becomes the German, uh, the German, uh, Belgian border and the German Luxembourgian border. The two main towns in the Ardennes are Bastogne right here. And you can see its importance because of all these roads coming in and out in the south central Ardennes and St. Vith which is a similar crossroad in the northeast and in some ways even more important than Bastogne because it has a railway running through it. This depicts the German plan of attack. Here we have uh, Sepp Dietrich's 6th SS Panzer Army zone of attack, which goes from roughly Monschau down through the Losheim Gap. These are all Hitler's favorites, the SS troops. And their mission is to come here, cross the Elsenborn Ridge, go through Malmody, get to Liege fast, and ultimately end up in Antwerp, which is Eisenhower's logistical jewel. No Antwerp, no logistics. That's Hitler's plan to bring, bring things to a standstill on the Western Front. Capture Antwerp. To the south is Hassel von Manteuffel's 5th Panzer Army. And its mission is to race along in parallel with, uh, with Dietrich and to protect the flank, but also get as far as Antwerp. So you've got two, two armies that are to drive all the way to Antwerp. The big obstacle they are worried about is forcing the Meuse. To the south is a supporting attack by uh, General Eric Brandenburger's 7th Army, which has a limited objective uh, just out to uh, pass Bastogne. And really what this attack is designed to do is to protect against reinforcements that the Germans figure are probably going to come up from the south. The Ardennes campaign played out in three phases. From 16 to 21 December 1944, the Germans clearly had the initiative. From 22 December 1944 to 4 January 1945, the initiative was in dispute with the Americans fighting hard to get it and the Germans fighting hard to keep it. We'll, we'll, we'll kill the slide, don't worry about it. From 5 to 31 January 45, the Americans were calling the shots, while the Germans gave ground grudgingly and exacted a high cost in both blood and time as they did so. So what I'm going to do now is talk you quickly through each of the three phases, and then I'm going to sum up with some comments about the Corps commanders. The attack mounted by the 6th SS Panzer Army in the early morning hours of 16 December lay almost entirely in the defensive sector of Giraud's 5th Corps. Its zone extended from slightly north of Monschau, about 20 miles, to just south of Losheim. The main attack unit was the 1st SS Panzer Corps which is assigned to roll over the Elsenborn Ridge and through the Losheim Gap on the way to the Meuse. On the American side of this front were deployed the newly arrived 99th Infantry Division, commanded uh, by Walter Lauer, and the veteran 2nd Infantry Division, commanded by William Robertson. The latter was attacking toward the border outpost of Wallerscheid in an effort to reach the Roar River dams. The 99th was hit hard by heavy, a heavy artillery barrage that began at 0530 and by the attacking forces of two Volksgrenadiers or People's Infantry Division. Giraud was sufficiently disturbed by the reports of the initial assaults that 11, at 1100 he telephoned his superior 
First Army Commander Courtney Hodges and requested permission to call off the attack of the second ID. Hodges refused. By the end of the day, Lauer had been forced to commit his division reserve, but he felt he had things relatively under control. Meanwhile, Giroux's deputy, Clarence Hubner, had gone forward to inform Robertson that the situation was potentially grave and that he should be prepared to halt his attack and withdraw at a moment's notice. The next morning, Giroux worked the phones again and pushed hard with Hodges to authorize withdrawal of the second ID from its exposed position. This time, Hodges relented and Giroux immediately ordered Robertson to pull back. This was very fortunate, for the 2nd ID's attack zone was right into the seam between two attacking German divisions. As the 2nd ID fell back on the twin villages of Krinkelt and Rokoroth, just east of the Elsenborn Ridge, the 99th ID, having been battered by repeated infantry and tank assaults, began to fall back. The result was a confused melee in which two regiments of the 2nd ID fought gamely to hold the twin villages while the 99th ID fell back on them. Robertson's leadership that day was inspirational. Over the next two days, a tremendous battle took rage for Krinkelt and Rokorot. Meanwhile, Giroux developed a plan to hold the critical high ground around Elsenborn, delay the German approach through the twin villages, build up an infantry engineer tank destroyer shield along the eastern and southern faces of the Elsenborn Ridge and position several divisions worth of artillery in the undulating folds of the ridge itself to pound whatever attackers approached. By the end of the day on the 19th, it appeared it just might work. By the evening of the 21st, it had. Although a German armored spearhead known as Kampfgruppe Piper had penetrated some 25 miles into the 5th Corps rear, Giroux and his valiant soldiers still held the vital Elsenborn Ridge. Middleton, whose corps occupied an 80-mile front, had a much more complicated situation than Giroux's. Along roughly 60 miles of the 8th Corps front, he was attacked by the combined forces of Monteufel's 5th Panzer Army and Brandenburger's 7th Panzer Army. So here you're a corps commander with two and a butt divisions, and you've got two armies with nine full-strength corps attacking you. Not a fun day. His corps was made up of the two typical kinds of divisions in the Ardennes, the untested and the exhausted. In the former category was the 106th Infantry, commanded by Archer Jones, which was which closed into its positions east of St. Vith just five days before the German offensive started. In the latter were the 28th Infantry, commanded by Norman Dutch Coda, which was stretched along a 25-mile front on the Skyline Drive, and the 4th Infantry, commanded by Raymond Barton, on the southern flank of the 28th. By the evening of 17 December, Middleton's front had been rent asunder. The two regiments of the 106th Infantry, positioned on the Schnee Eiffel, were completely surrounded. The Corps artillery supporting the 106th was either cut off or in retreat. The center regiment of the 28th Infantry had virtually disintegrated, and the northernmost regiment of the 4th Infantry was being steadily pushed back. The only small slivers of good news were that a combat command of the 7th Armored had arrived at St. Fifth to stiffen the 106th, and help was likewise on the way from the 10th Armored coming up from the south. Over the next four days, Middleton kept his wits about him and developed the concept to hold on to Bastogne, which because of the seven roads that crossed there made it vital to the German drive to the Meuse. This plan contained two main elements. Using the Corps Reserve, Combat Command R of the 9th Armored to outpost the important road junctions east of the town, and using a reinforcing unit, Combat Command B of the 10th Armored, 
to defend an inner ring of small towns north, northeast, and east of the Central Crossroads. On 18 December, Middleton learned the 101st Airborne would be sent to Bastogne, but he could not be certain about when it would arrive. If it got there in time, Bastogne just might be held. Attempting to hold Bastogne required Middleton to make excruciating choices. At 10.45 a.m. on the morning of the 18th, CCR, 9th Armored Division Commander, requested permission to withdraw or reinforce Task Force Rose, a detachment defending a small village 12 miles northeast of Bastogne. Middleton refused both entreaties, and the task force was overrun late that afternoon. A similar request to withdraw a reinforced battalion of the 10th Armored made the evening of the 18th was likewise denied. Fortunately for Middleton, the 101st, temporarily commanded by Anthony McAuliffe, arrived the evening of the 18th, and by the morning of the 19th, its lead regiment was fighting against the spearhead of the Ponsonlair Division on the east side of Bastogne, rather than in the center or on the west side. On the 20th, at Bradley's direction, Middleton moved his headquarters to Neuf Chateau, leaving the defense of Bastogne to the 101st Airborne, under whose command he placed CCA 10th Armor. By the evening of the 21st, Bastogne was surrounded. But thanks in large part to Middleton's coolness under extreme stress, it was still in American hands. Meanwhile, Matthew Ridgway's 18th Airborne Corps, stationed in England, had flown to Rems, moved by truck to Verbamont, which is west of St. Viv, where it became operational at noon on 19 December. In broad terms, its mission was to plug the yawning gap between Giraud's V Corps and Middleton's VIII Corps. But this mission devolved into a number of particulars. First, it had to contain, then eliminate, Piper's Kampfgruppe. Second, it had to determine, Ridgway had to determine, if St. Vith could be held, or if Robert Hasbrook, 7th Armored, and the remnants of the 106th Infantry, which had repulsed repeated attacks by multiple German divisions, would have to be withdrawn. Its third task was to defend along a menacing, against a menacing attack from the south being mounted by the 2nd SS Panzer Division. And finally, Ridge Day was charged with defending to the southwest along the approaches to the Meuse. By the evening of the 21st, his core front extended some 45 miles. Okay, now remember this. Two days ago, Ridgeway, or two days before this, Ridgeway had been in England inspecting airborne training and planning future air operations. Now he's smack dab in the middle of the biggest offensive of the war, and he's got a 45-mile front, most of whom, most of his subordinates, he's never commanded before, with the exception of Gavin. By the evening, okay, the most critical of these three sectors were St. Fifth. Here, all of Ridgeway's instincts told him to hold, but Monteufel's unremitting pressure would soon force him to consider. In this phase, Milliken's Eddies and Collins's Corps were preparing to enter the fray. Next phase. During the second phase of the bulge, we'll first follow the action on the southern side, conducted by Milliken's Middleton's and Eddie's Corps, then examined the fight on the northern side, conducted by Ridgeway's, Collins, and Giroux's Corps. But first, I must backtrack to point out that effective 20 December, Eisenhower had placed the northern half of the battlefield under Bernard Montgomery's operational control. The southern half remained in Bradley's sector, but the day-to-day -day supervision of the three corps operating therein was exercised by Third Army Commander George Patton. Patton chose Milliken's Third Corps to direct the three-division attack against the southern flank of the German penetration by dint of its position in Metz. Despite his singular lack of enthusiasm about having a combat rookie carry out this high-profile mission, 
But Milliken handled both his difficult task and his overbearing superior with a good deal of presence and savoir faire. When Patton blustered that Milliken's divisions should attack in columns of regiments, which would have left them vulnerable to Germans harassing their flanks, Milliken passed the army commander's suggestions to his subordinates, but he made it clear that they should exercise their own discretion as to choice of formations. In the event, none of them chose to adopt Patton's idea. When Hugh Gaffey's 4th Armored got bogged down southeast of Bastogne, Milliken inserted a squadron of the 6th Cavalry Group on the division's right, allowing Gaffey to swing his combat command R around to the southwest from where the relief of Bastogne was affected by Crate Nabram's battalion on 26 December. In the opening days of the new year, when the German ca Germans counterattacked hard at Hitler's express order in an all-out, last-ditch effort to take Bastogne and almost severed the vital artery connecting it to Arlon, Milliken kept his head and not only held, but gradually widened the corridor. And all the while, he directed Willard's 26th ID in an attack on Wilts that created what the Germans later referred to as the Harlinga Pocket. In short, while Milliken was indeed a rookie, he hit a solid RBI single in his first major league at bat. Middleton's first challenge during this phase of the bulge was to reconstitute the shattered 28th Division, whose G3 noted in his situation report of 24 December that the unit's combat efficiency was, quote, unknown. Imagine that, being a G3 and reporting up the chain. My division's combat efficiency is unknown. Accurate statement. He also labored to establish contact with Ridgeway's 18th Airborne Corps to the north. The most difficult task was clawing away at the German forces that had surrounded the western side of Bastogne. Patton's expectations were high, but the ferocity of the German attacks, the greenness of the divisions assigned to 8th Corps, and the freezing cold of the Ardennes in early January all frustrated Middleton's attempts to break through the German crust on Bastogne's western flank. Eddie's 12th Corps had only a minor role in this phase of the campaign. His task was to regain the ground lost to the German 7th Army in its holding attack across the Zauer into Luxembourg. To do this, he had Barton's battered 4th Infantry, a combat command of John Leonard's 9th Armored, and Stafford Red Irwin's relatively fresh 5th Infantry. His task was complicated by the rugged compartments formed by the multiple river valleys that cut across the Luxembourgian hills stinking weather, and a determined German defense. But Eddie husbanded his forces well, and in a series of limited objective attacks, closed on the Zauer by the evening of 28 December. We'll now see how Ridgway and Collins fought in the north to wrest the initiative from the Germans, while Giraud, having stood firm on the Elsenborn Ridge, continued to hold and regroup. I imagine most of you have been out to Gettysburg and you understand what Meade's army was like after being battered by Bobby Lee for three days. That's about what Giroux's Corps was like. It had held on to the Elsenborn Ridge, but that was just all it was capable of doing. 18th Airborne Corps' evolving task in this phase of the bulge confronted Ridgeway with several significant command challenges. The first was what to do about St. Vith. A dire message from Hasbrook on 22 December galvanized him into action. He approved Hasbrook's recommendation for withdrawal. He went forward into the horseshoe safe salient around St. Vith to meet with the principal commanders. He relieved the combat ineffective Arthur Jones with the command of the 106th Infantry, and he attached the remnants of that division to Hasbrook. The great bulk of the St. Fifth Defenders made it behind the Psalm River and into the protective embrace of James Gavin's 82nd Airborne. But Ridgeway's work was just beginning. 
for the newly committed 2nd SS Panzer Corps had its sights on the Meuse, which meant tearing a hole in the 18th Airborne Corps defenses. The high point of the attack came with the Germans' Christmas Eve capture of Manet, just five miles from the Corps command post. Ridgeway threw in everything he had to get it back, including the desperately fatigued soldiers of the 7th Armored. The SS men had held tenaciously, but were finally dislodged two days later by massive doses of artillery and a gutsy attack by Gavin's paratroopers. Ridgeway immediately started thinking about going over to the attack, but he was restrained from doing so by Montgomery's caution, as well as that of 1st Army Commander Courtney Hodges. The result was a limited objective attack launched on 3 January solely by the soldiers of the 82nd Airborne. Meanwhile, Collins and 7th Corps had, at Monty's request, been pulled out of the line and sent to Mayon to defend the Meuse south of Liège and prepare a counterthrust against the 2nd Panzer Division that was closing menacingly on Dinant. Again, that's where Rommel had crossed the Meuse. The Germans remembered that. Collins was itching for a fight, but Montgomery issued instructions for him instead to be prepared to withdraw to the northwest. Collins turned a deaf ear to these cautionary utterings and unleashed Harmon's 2nd Armor Division on the 2nd Panzer Division's lead Kampfgruppe at Sells. The result was a stunning victory for the Americans over the gas starved Germans that punctuated the high mark, the high water mark of Hitler's offensive. This splendid piece of offensive action was offset somewhat by a successful German attack west of Manet at the tiny hamlet of Zadzo, where a regiment of Faye Prickett's inexperienced 75th Infantry allowed a thousand yard gap to develop in its lines. During the ensuing debacle, the soldiers of Maurice Rose's Third Armor closed the gap on 29 December, thus marking the end of 2nd SS Panzer Corps' offensive action. Collins, like Ridgway, was soon leaning forward in the foxhole, proposing multiple attack plans to 1st Army. But Monty chose the most conservative option, which had 7th Corps squeezing the bulge from the north in an attack directed toward Hoopolis. By the evening of 4 January, 7th Corps had, as Monty had accurately predicted, gained precious little ground against determined German resistance. I've already told you about Jerome's Corps. All right, now I'm going to shift to the part of the bulge that's least written about, the American offensive. The final phase of the bulge was brutal. The weather was the coldest in years. The Germans conducted a grudging, costly defense, and the rugged terrain of the Ardennes that had mostly favored the Americans to this phase of the battle now distinctly favored the Germans. This forced the Corps commanders to regulate the tempo of battle in such a way that ground would be gained at an acceptable cost in human treasure. Striking the right balance here was not simple but for the most part, they managed it quite well. Collins was a great exemplar here. He was favored by making the First Army's main effort, and he used his resources wisely. He arranged his corps with two armor divisions, Harmon's 2nd and Rose's 3rd, in the lead echelon, followed closely by two infantry divisions, Robert Macon's 83rd and Alexander Bowling's 84th. To give the armored units extra punch, he attached a regiment of infantry to each. When the attack began to flag, he passed two infantry divisions through the tankers. When the Germans showed signs of weakening, he placed all four divisions on line to maintain the momentum of the offensive. As a result, the second armored division linked up with soldiers of Middleton's 8th Corps just west of Hoopolis on 16 January. In the ensuing drive to the east, 7th Corps was pinched out between the advancing forces of Ridgeway's Corps to the north and Millikan's to the south. 
Ridgeway's mission was to recapture St. Vith, but he was frustrated by Hodge's withholding of Leland Hobbs' 30th Infantry Division from the initial attack. Nevertheless, he eventually convinced Hodges to release a regiment at a time into the offensive. By rights, Ridgeway also should have been given command of Cliff Andrus's 1st Infantry, which is attacking on the 18th Corps left through the critical Odenval defile, but Andrus remained under 5th Corps control. Despite this handicap, Ridgeway pushed the 30th Infantry and the 7th Armor southward against stiff German resistance. But after the capture of the small town Born on 21 January, the German Corps commander defending St. Vith realized the jig was up. Although ordered by Monteufel to defend the town, he left it garrisoned only by 250 Volksgrenadiers. So a month and a day after Hasbrook's soldiers had been driven from St. Vith, they returned to reclaim it, thus accomplishing the most important 18th Corps task in the final days of the Bulge. Giraud gave up command of 5th Corps to Hubner on 15 January to become the 15th Army commander. Hubner's salient contribution to the final phase of the Bulge was directing Andrus's 1st Infantry in the seizure of the Odenval defile, which opened the gate for Ridgeway's Corps to drive on St. Vith. All right, so that takes care of what was happening on the north side of the Bulge in the final phase. Down to the south, the strong German concentration around Bastogne meant that the final fighting would be much more desperate than it was in the north. It took a full week, from the 5th to the 12th of January, for Middleton to expand the perimeter around the western face of Bastogne and begin to mount a drive on Hoopolis. Finally, after repeating pounded repeated pounding by 8th Corps units, the Germans gave up a few hamlets west of Bastogne. But they seemed to want to hang on to Foy, a small village due north of the town, for the duration of the war. In an attack immortalized in the HBO series Band of Brothers, soldiers of Company E, 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, 101st Airborne Division, captured Foy on 13 January. This set the conditions for a task force from Kilburn's 11th Army to dash north to Hoopolis to link up with Collins's Corps and 1st Army. With the capture of Hoopolis, Middleton wheeled 8th Corps to the east and drove toward the Skyline Drive, which was back in American hands by 28 January. Middleton's tenacious yet prudent fighting in this phase of the bulge has never been properly appreciated, and it marks him as an effective commander in the offense, as well as in the defense. Now, while Milliken was clawing his way along the western edge of Bastogne, Middleton was. Milliken advanced to the east. He moved Van Fleet's fresh infantry into the line and then mounted a concentric three-division attack against the Harlinga pocket. There were a few anxious moments engendered by a stout enemy defense, but Milliken's scheme of maneuver collapsed the pocket, and virtually destroyed the German 5th Parachute Division. Over the next five days, he steadily expanded the Bastogne perimeter along an arc roughly six miles northeast and five miles east of the town, and then advanced rapidly to the east against faltering resistance. By 28 January, he was abreast of Middleton along the Skyline Drive. So now... We've gone back and captured the original line of the German attack everywhere but in Eddie's 12th Corps sector. Eddie's single contribution to the final phase of the bulge was convincing Patton of the unwisdom of attempting attack east across the Zauer River into Germany and then north toward Prune. Instead, he argued for and won Patton's approval for an attack north across the Sur continuing northward along the southern reaches of the Skyline Drive. It worked almost exactly as planned, with Irwin's 5th Infantry making the main attack on either side of Diekirch, and Horace McBride's 80th Infantry joining in a supporting attack further west. The 12th Corps attack also allowed 
American fighter bombers to pound several German divisions that were scrambling to get back to the fatherland over bridges at the hour, over the bridges on the hour that had brought him to the Ardennes six weeks earlier. Thus, by the 8th of January, all a member, all corps except Collins's, which was pinched out, had closed on the original German line of departure, while Collins's were, men were getting some well-deserved rest. The Battle of the Bulge was over. Okay. Now, what's the wrap-up? The question that now naturally arises is how these six officers stacked up against the command desiderata formulated by the Army between the wars. I found a few minor weaknesses. After the battle, Middleton was evasive about his responsibility for the capture of the two regiments of the 106th Infantry Division on the Schnee Eiffel, and Ridgeway was arguably a day late in his decision to order the evacuation of the St. Fifth Defenders. But taken as a whole, the Corps commanders performed remarkably well in very tough circumstances. Giroux was rock solid at the Elsenborn Ridge. Middleton kept his head, saved Bastogne, and fought his way back along the town's western side. Ridgeway was staunchness personified in plugging the gap between V Corps and VIII Corps. Milliken was professional and imperturbable as a rookie commander in the relief of Bastogne. Eddie played his limited role on the southern shoulder with calmness and finesse. And Collins was absolutely masterful in his timing of the counterattack at Sells. I'd like to wrap up with three points. First, these six men made important contributions to the American victory in the bulge. Their task was to translate the operational designs of their superiors into effective higher-level tactics that established the requisite conditions for their subordinates to succeed. And they fulfilled this charge remarkably well. Second, the structure of the Corps itself was almost as important as the men who commanded the formation. It gave field army commanders a flexible echelon of command that allowed them to focus combat power where and when necessary to meet the kaleidoscopically shifting demands of a dynamic battlefield. And finally, Although there is certainly no magic prescription for command in war, study of the Corps Commanders of the Bulge suggests that a harmonious blend of intelligence, character, and energy will go a long way toward battlefield success when the stakes are high and the circumstances difficult. Thanks very much. I'll be glad to take questions. What was your research in finding about the garbled transmission uh, of phone call, which resulted in Jones not withdrawing the two regiments uh, from the Schnee Eiffel? Everybody heard the question, right? Uh, I'll tell you my reaction to that. Um, it comes from McDonald's book, A Time for Trumpets. And uh, I really take my hat off to Charlie McDonald. He did what Sam did and what I did. We both fought there and wrote about it. That requires both courage and objectivity. I think in the final analysis, um, there's some creative filling in the gaps there. Uh, because McDonald didn't source it, I was never able to trace it down. I'm sure he came across something that suggested that to him. But the fundamental problem goes much, much, much deeper. The fundamental problem is twofold. First, it's a long way from Bastogne to St. Pitt. Middleton's headquarters was in Bastogne. 
Joan's question was in St. Fifth. And there were a lot of Germans in between. And so there was no opportunity at all for Middleton to go out and visit his division commanders. It just could not be done. He had to, he had to communicate with Jones through very tenuous measures. So that's the first part of the problem. The second part of the problem is that General Jones was brand new to the theater. And Middleton did not know him well. Now, Middleton had the good sense to send a lieutenant colonel from his G2 section, whose name I cannot remember, I'm sorry, up to St. Vith to sort of chaperone General Jones, if you will, and answer questions for him about the 8th Corps commander's intentions and the general orientation of fighting in the Ardennes. Remember, he'd only been in position five days when the battle started. I, in, in the final analysis, what it comes down to is when, is, is that General Jones either did not know how bad the situation was facing those two regiments, or he sensed it and did not yet have the gumption to say, I'm going to act as I think best and not worry about what the Corps commander wants. So there's the problem on that end. And forgive me if I'm going to be a little bit unkind here, but the problem on Middleton's end is he did what was by the book the right thing. He let the man on the spot make the call. But his default assumption was that Jones was a competent division commander. And I think we have a lot of evidence that suggests that Archer Jones, for all of his other endearing qualities, was out of his depth in that situation, that new in field. If he'd had a chance to break in like other division commanders had and get with that, get faced with a situation that terrible, a month, two months, three months into his combat command tenure, he might have reacted much differently. But fate dealt him a cruel hand, and he would prove incapable of making the decision on his own and uh, deferred to the Corps commander. The Corps commander deferred back. Now, this is, this is the area that I said, if, if, you read, if you read the interviews that were done with Middleton after the battle, there's one done about, I can't, can't remember exactly when. I think it's on about the 8th, 8th of February. Slam Marshall sent somebody out there very early to interview Middleton. So there's a very early interview, and there's another one done several weeks later, and then there's another one done months later. And, of course, he has to write about it in his after-action report at the end of February. Story changes a little bit each time on Middleton's part. And uh, I think I think he just he made an error in human judgment. In what he should have done, in my opinion, I put this in the book, I think he should have said, Jones is new. I've been here a long while. I know how exposed the Schnee Eiffel is. And as soon as he found out that there was a significant German attack, he should have phoned Jones and said, Get those regiments off the Schnee Eiffel and bring them back behind the river. That's what I think he should have done, uh, but he didn't do it. Other questions? When Eisenhower made the decision to assign the troops north of the bulge to Montgomery, in the northern half, of in the, the northern half of the bulge to Montgomery, he in effect squeezed Bradley out of the battle. Would you care to make a couple of comments on that? I would. Thought, thought that might come up. Okay. Uh, arguably Eisenhower's most controversial decision in the bulge. 
arguably his best from my point of view. I'll, let me, I'd like to elaborate. Okay. First, let's look at this thing from the German side. At best, the bulge has a 5% chance of success. At best. There's a long quote from Dietrich that I wish I had memorized that I don't, but where he lays out in a long lament what Hitler is asking him to do, and it's, it's friggin' mission impossible. So the only hope, the only hope of making the bulge work is to split the alliance. To drive a wedge psychologically and politically between the Americans and the British. Once Eisenhower makes that decision, it can never happen. He doesn't know that that's what's underlying the other side. That isn't why he makes it. But he knows that allied unity is essential. So that's that's the first reason that I think it's the best decision he makes. Second reason is that Okay, I'm going to be a little controversial here. Montgomery is a better man battle manager than Bradley. That isn't, again, it isn't why he makes it, but it's a good reason to have made it. The real reason, though, that I think is most operative is geography. Geography and Bradley's unwillingness to move his headquarters. Bradley has positioned the Army Group headquarters in Luxembourg City well, well forward in anticipation of a major offensive by Patton into the Tsar. He wants to be well forward for that offensive. And so when this huge German penetration comes in north of Luxembourg, he no longer has any direct way that he can get to Hodges' his first army. He tries it, and it just, the Germans are getting thrown so fast, he says, ah, tells Chester Hansen, forget it. So he's left to communicating with Hodges, whose sector is the most affected, uh, simply through telephones, which become unreliable, and then radio traffic. And this to Eisenhower is not acceptable. So when he talks to him, he says, Brad, pull your headquarters back. And Brad says, Ike, I'm not going to do it. And we, we, we know from the record why he isn't going to do it. Because in his Jeep ride to Versailles on the first day of the bulge, he, he talks to Chet Hansen. Actually, I think it's the next day on the way back to Luxembourg. And they see people starting to stream to the rear. And he says, General, are you going to pull the headquarters back? And he says, no, because I do not want to imbue panic in the Luxembourgians. And he may have been thinking, too, about what happened on the Western Front in World War I when the British pulled an army headquarters out in the spring of 1918 during Ludendorff's first offensive, and the defense fell apart. He may just think, okay, this isn't pretty, but the best thing to do is just sit tight. From, and, 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 and Ike ultimately, after the bulge, orders him to pull it back, and he brings it back to, he brings it back, I believe, to Namur. Okay. So after the bulge, Ike, doesn't have any truck with it anymore. He says, hey, that headquarters is too far forward. Bring it back. And at, at that point, Bradley's forced to comply after the crisis is over. So the other part of this whole thing is Eisenhower intuits that Courtney Hodges needs adult supervision. That he can't manage the thing on his own. Getting indication that Hodges is tired. If you read Dave Hogan's book on 
uh, command post at war on the first army headquarters there's an inexplicable period of about 30 hours where Hodges is incommunicado from most of his staff there are lots of interpretations about that period that I don't want to go into Dave Hogan researched it far more deeply than I did and he said it is a great mystery I can't explain it. and there are all sorts of conflicting accounts but Eisenhower sensed that Hodges was going to need close supervision authority. Bradley couldn't get it to him. Monty could. Now, here's the real reason. I think the real reason I did it is that Monty, with his phantom system, knew more about what was going on in the bulge than Hodges did. He had liaison officers further forward who were giving him reports faster. And he started moving the 30th Corps down to the Meuse. And Eisenhower's line on the European map on the 19th of December at Verdun was, they shall not pass the Meuse. Okay? It was like Verdun all over again. They shall not pass. And I can go into much more depth on that some other time. But Monty's beginning to move the 30th Corps down to the west bank of the Meuse, north of uh, uh, north of Dinant. He probably would have left it there anyway and reinforced it out of his own self-interest. But if you make him respond, if you give him command of both Simpson's Ninth Army and Hodges' First Army, then Monty is into the battle full thing. And you know damn well that 30th Corps is going to be there as the emergency backstop if it's needed. And I think that's the real reason Eisenhower did it. Once Brad said he wasn't good, he gave him an out. He said, Brad, pull your headquarters back and I'm not going to do this. Brad said, I'm not going to pull my headquarters back. And so that's that's my read of the situation. I think we have time for one more question. Henry? Uh, this is about the weather, <clears throat> how you mentioned uh, the weather conditions uh, at that time, starting in November, December, January. Uh, as I recall, something like 80% of all the Cold War injuries in the Second World War to American soldiers took place at that time. I wonder if um, there was a difference, a profound difference, a great difference between Germans suffering from the weather effects, if you know that. And I wonder, uh, perhaps you might care to comment on the cold weather conditions uh, in that winter uh, of 44, 45. I, I recall Patton saying almost precisely this, our number one enemy right now is not the Germans, but the, but the weather. And it had to do with the cold weather injuries. Well, I'll answer my part of it first. I don't know enough about German cold weather injuries to answer your question. I haven't researched it. I don't know the answer. Uh, so I just want to leave that there. And then Sam was there. I, I wasn't. So I'll let him just speak about how cold it was. The doctor may know the percentage we had in uh, trench foot. I know in my platoon I've only had two, but I got up every... 20 minutes, got two men out of that foxhole and made them walk the ridge in the dark. But the only thing there, after you made two trips, it turned to ice. So we had to move up and down the hill. So all through the night, I took my men and went to every foxhole, brought them out, and that's how we prevented it. But I read some figures, I forgot them now, 15%, whatever it is, to trench foot. There was quite a bit. But I remember in the foxhole, we had icicles this long on the side of and I took patrol through the German lines, and it was 10, 10 to 15 degrees above zero. Thank you. I will say if uh, all junior leaders had been conscientious as Lieutenant Lombardo, the incidence of trench foot would have been much, much less. Uh, sadly, that was not the case. Uh, I, there is one other thing I want to say, though, in answer to the gentleman's question about Ike's decision. 
The other thing that did, and I didn't have time to talk about it in this evening's presentation, but it, it is in the book. The other big thing, Eisenhower's decision to give Monty the northern half of the bulge did, it brought the whole RAF into the fight, lock, stock, and barrel. And that was no small thing. Well, Dr. Winton, I certainly can't improve on what uh, Colonel Lombardo has said about uh, what a, a vivid picture you've given for us. But I think everybody here who has any appreciation for military history, the Battle of the Bulge is a very special time in American military history. And uh, it, we, we all think we know what we know about it, but uh, as you said, you've given us a very different cut, and it's uh, it's been very informative, very entertaining. We appreciate what you've done to help uh, increase our knowledge of this very critical time in history. And what I'd like to do is, on behalf of uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mark Viney, our director, and the entire staff of the Army Heritage Education Center, I'd like to present you this reduced copy of your poster uh, as, a, as a thank you for your uh, presentation tonight. Well, thank you very, thank you very much, much, Mike. Thank you. And if you'll just um, if you'll just join uh, Rodney and uh, and Walter over there, I, I can't resist this. one last testimonial, and I know it's a cold evening. You want to get off? This facility is magnificent. A lot of what I learned that went into that book, I found here. So it's your taxpayers' money and donation money that's keeping it going. Use it. <laughs> thank you.